Hello and welcome to lesson 15 of 20 in the URSA campus breakdown course on introductory statistics and probability. This is module four, introduction to inferential statistics, part one, point estimates and confidence intervals for a single population. Let's get started. In the previous module, we studied the fundamentals of random variables and then applied them to calculating probabilities related to distributions of sample means and proportions. This work, however, was based upon the assumption that we knew the key population parameters such as mean or proportion and standard deviation. Most work in statistics, however, is based upon us not knowing for sure what these parameters are. In fact, it is because we don't know these values for certain that most of the need for statistical analysis arises. In this module, we turn our attention to inferential statistics, which is about using sample data to make educated guesses about these often elusive population parameters. The topics covered in this module include point estimates and confidence intervals for a single population, point estimates and confidence intervals comparing two populations, hypothesis testing concerning sample means and proportions for a single population, and hypothesis testing concerning sample means and proportions comparing two populations. We begin our study of inferential statistics by looking at how we can use sample data to generate estimates about sample means and proportions, considering how precision and level of confidence are traded off in the process, and how sample size influences these factors as well. The topics covered in this lesson include point estimates for population means and proportions, confidence interval fundamentals, confidence intervals for means and proportions for a single population, and determining minimum sample size. If we want to know with certainty the mean value mu for some quantity related to a population, then we must conduct a census as discussed previously. If we're not able to conduct a census, then the next best option is to obtain a random sample from the population and use it to make an informed guess as to what mu might be. If we collect a sample, then it should seem natural that the sample mean x bar would provide us with a logical single value estimate for mu. This idea is reinforced by the central limit theorem, which tells us that the expected value of x bar is mu and that as the sample size increases, the dispersion of x bar about mu diminishes towards zero. A single value estimate of a parameter, such as x bar as an estimate of mu, is called a point estimate. In the case of population means, therefore, we can say in general that if a random sample is obtained from a population with mean mu, then the sample mean x bar represents an unbiased point estimate for mu. In example one, a random sample of 10 harvested logs from a forest is collected with the age of each tree measured and recorded. The data, which is, consists of ages in years, is as follows. 38, 47, 44, 39, 45, 43, 46, 56, 33, and 46. So for this sample, x bar is calculated as we've done before, and it equals the sum of all the values divided by the sample size. And so we end up getting a sample mean x bar equal to 43.7 years. So we can say therefore that x bar equals 43.7 years, would be an unbiased point estimate for mu equal the mean age of all trees harvested from this forest. Similarly, if we wanted to know the proportion P of a population that had a certain either or attribute, we would need to conduct a census in order to know this value for certain. As with the population mean, the next best option is to obtain a random sample from the population and calculate the sample proportion p bar. 
In the case of a population proportion, therefore, we can say in general that if a random sample is obtained from a population with proportion p, then the sample proportion p bar represents an unbiased point estimate for p. In example two, a random sample of 1,000 eligible voters in Canada were surveyed about their preference between retaining a constitutional monarchy versus abolishing the monarchy and replacing it with a republic. Among the 1,000 people surveyed, 682 stated that they preferred the republic model. So the sample proportion of voters favoring the republic option is calculated as we've done before. P bar equals 682 divided by 1,000, which equals 0 0.682. So therefore, P bar equals 0 0.682 would be an unbiased point estimate for the proportion P of all eligible voters in Canada who favor a republic over a constitutional monarchy. As the preceding examples show, it is relatively straightforward to obtain point estimates for population parameters such as mu and p by simply obtaining a sample and calculating the corresponding sample parameter. And if our sampling methods are appropriately random, we can therefore think of these point estimates as unbiased. So far, so good. The problem with these estimates, however, is that they essentially have zero probability of being correct guesses of the true population parameters. Now, why is this so? Well, the answer comes from the fact that population parameters such as mu and p are generally continuously distributed even when the distributions of the underlying random variables are discrete, as we have discussed in the previous lesson about sampling distributions and the central limit theorem. So, for example, if a random sample of tree ages has a mean of 43.7 years, it by all means tells us that the population mean is probably somewhere around 43.7 years. However, since mu equals the mean tree age, can take on a virtually infinite number of different values, and there is only a finite total amount of probability equal to one to share among all possible values for mu, we must conclude that the probability that mu equals exactly 43.7 is virtually zero. Even if this value is the best possible single value estimate we can make, which it is. In general, we can state that for any population with non-zero variation for a particular quantity, i.e. where the quantity of interest is a random variable, that the probability that mu equals x bar and the probability that p equals p bar, which in both cases is the probability that a population parameter equals the point estimate, is virtually equal to zero. Now, the above conclusion means that we require another kind of estimate other than a point estimate if we want our educated guesses for population parameters to have some likelihood of being correct. In the case of continuous random variables in general, recall that the probability that x equals some particular value, little x, is virtually equal to zero, while the probability that x is between two values a and b is always between 0 and 1. In other words, while individual values have zero probability associated with them, intervals do have some probability. It is therefore via the use of interval estimates over point estimates that we can make informed guesses about population parameters with some level of confidence. The next section of this lesson examines how this is done. In the case of example one, we are interested in estimating mu equals the population mean age of harvested trees for a forest. And the best information available to us is a random sample of 10 harvested trees with X bar equals 43.7 years. If we think of x bar as a random variable and invoke the central limit theorem, which says that x bar tends towards a normal distribution, then we can imagine the following bell-shaped curve, as you see in the, on the slide below, with our obtained value of x bar equals 43.7 in the middle as our unbiased point estimate from u. 
Now, note that the horizontal axis is labeled mu, even though mu itself is not a random variable, but rather a fixed quantity that we are trying to estimate. The idea we are trying to convey here is that to us at least in our limited capacity when a census is not possible, mu always remains an elusive value that we can at best only estimate. In the diagram above, the area under the curve equals one, and as per the rule for continuous random variables, the probability that mu equals x bar equals 43.7 is virtually zero as discussed earlier. If we instead consider an interval about the central value of x bar equals 43.7, then we would certainly have some non-zero probability for the likelihood that mu was contained somewhere within it. The diagram below shows what this would look like in a general sense. So you can see the bell curve here and the area that's shaded is centered on x bar and it goes uh, to the left over by an amount that is the margin of error and to the right by the same margin of error. And we use ME as a short form for the margin of error of the interval estimate. So we can see that the, area, the blue area represents the probability that mu is between x bar minus ME and x bar plus ME. So another way of saying that is that the shaded area in the diagram consists of the interval x bar plus or minus ME which we can write in brackets showing the lower bound, x bar minus me, and then the comma, and then x bar plus me. We call this a confidence interval, and we use the letter, the, um, the short form ci. We call this a confidence interval estimate for mu. Now note, for any continuous random variable, the probability is the same whether you include the endpoints or not. In other words, whether you've got the equal signs on the a or the b, uh, makes no difference because the probability that x equals those specific values of a and b are virtually zero. So therefore the closed interval with the square brackets and the corresponding open interval with the round brackets will contain equal probabilities. As a result, either form can be used. However, since the more common convention for confidence intervals uses the round brackets, we will likewise use the round brackets. So we'll use uh, open bracket, open round bracket x bar minus me comma x bar plus me and then closed round bracket for this course. A confidence interval gets its name from the fact that the interval estimate for mu has a level of confidence and we use the short form LOC associated with it defined as follows. Level of confidence is equal to the probability that mu is between x bar minus the margin of error and x bar plus the margin of error. This definition is illustrated in the following general diagram of a confidence interval for a population mean. So we call that a CI mu. So you can see the diagram. It's got the bell curve and the area in the middle shaded in blue. Uh, that is the confidence interval and the uh, outside outlying areas, uh, which are the sort of, we call them the tails as well, um, are in red. And uh, we note the following about uh, this diagram. First of all, the area of the confidence interval, the area of the CI mu, is equal to the level of confidence, the LOC. And the area under the curve that is outside of the CI mu is equal to alpha, where alpha is defined as is equal to the level of significance associated with the CI mu. Now we'll discuss level of significance in further detail later in this module, but we will de define right here now that in general, the level of confidence is equal to one minus the level of significance or LOC equals one minus alpha. And then rearranging, we can solve for alpha and alpha equals one minus the level, uh, uh, one minus the LOC. So you can see uh, why we get these from the diagram, given that the total area under the curve is one, these, these formulas result from the fact that the LOC plus alpha adds up to one. Now, one last point is as the CI mu is symmetrical about the central value of X bar, 
the two tails on either side of the CI mu are of equal area equal to alpha over 2 so that together the two tails add up to alpha. The larger the margin of error, ME, the wider the confidence interval. So that leads to the following conclusions. Firstly, a point estimate is essentially a confidence interval with margin of error equal to zero, and therefore the level of confidence equals zero, as you can see in the first diagram on the slide at the top. Below that, we see a 25% confidence interval. So in order, in order to get um, a probability of 25%, we need to move out from either side of X bar, and we see that in the diagram. So the area, the shaded area in blue is equal to 0.25. Now, the most common confidence intervals are those with level of confidence equal to 90, 95, or 99%. Now, it's possible to, to define a, a confidence interval of anywhere between 0 and, and 1, or 0 and 100%. But the ones that you'll see in, in everyday practice used most often are those three values, 90, 95, and 99%. And you, see, you can see the diagrams below show that as we go from 0.9 to 0.99, we see that we, we have a wider confidence interval to capture those areas under the curve. To determine how the margin of error ME is defined, let's consider the case where we are trying to estimate the value of a population mean mu. The, diagram, well, the diagrams below show the general case of a CI mu plotted first in terms of the random variable x and then converted to the standard normal z variable. So you can see in the diagram below on the left, we have x bar at the center of our confidence interval and the area is equal to the level of confidence. And then in order to get that amount of level of confidence, we need to have uh, move out to the left and right of or below and above x bar by an amount equal to the margin of error. So we see that the uh, confidence interval captures uh, the range between x bar minus me and x bar plus me, as we've discussed before. Now, if we standardize this so that we look at what the z scores, the corresponding uh, z values are for these, we can see that we have a confidence interval that's centered at zero. And that's always the case when we're doing these sorts of confidence intervals, that x bar is always uh, corresponds to a z value of zero and the values to the left or the right that that frame the confidence interval are minus z and plus z subscript alpha over two and the alpha over two of course is because we want there to be half of the outlying area on each side we want a symmetrical confidence interval so we have plus or minus z of alpha over two from the central limit theorem, we know that for sufficiently large sample size n, that x bar is distributed approximately normally with mean of mu and standard deviation of sigma over root n. And we know that the formula for that, for z, is that z equals x bar minus mu times root n over sigma. So if you look at the diagram at the top right, Substituting for z, we get that the probability that x bar minus mu times root n over sigma falls between minus z alpha over 2 and plus z alpha over 2 is approximately equal to the level of confidence. Now, doing a few mathematical steps, what we get on the second last line is that the probability that mu is between x bar minus z alpha over 2 times sigma over root n and x bar plus z alpha over 2 times sigma over root n is approximately equal to the level of confidence. And so the confidence interval that we get at this level of confidence for mu is therefore equal to x bar plus or minus z alpha over 2 times sigma over root n, which you see written in confidence interval notation uh, with the round brackets and the lower limit is x bar minus z alpha over 2 times sigma over root n, and the upper limit is x bar plus z alpha over 2 times sigma over root n. The formula for ci mu that we 
just developed gives us a means of calculating a confidence interval for a population mean for any specified level of confidence. Close inspection of the formula, however, reveals that we need to know the population standard deviation sigma in order to calculate the CI mu. Now this is problematic because if we don't know for certain what mu is, which is why we are trying to estimate it, then how would we know what sigma is? The answer, of course, is that we don't, be, unless we are able to conduct a census, which we can't if we're trying to come up with a CI mu in the first place. Now, the solution to this problem is twofold, as follows. First, we can use our obtained sample standard deviation, S, as an estimate of sigma, similar to how we use the sample mean X bar to estimate mu. The second part of the solution deals with the fact that, strictly speaking, the above formula for CI mu is not valid when S is used instead of sigma, namely because the use of the normal distribution, and hence the Z term in the above formula, requires us to know sigma. The solution required is an alternative but similar probability distribution to the normal distribution that allows us to use S instead of sigma. This is provided to us in the form of what's called the student's T distribution, named after a century ago statistician who published his work under the pseudonym student. The T distribution, as we will call it henceforth, is actually a family of bell-shaped curves very similar to the standard normal Z distribution as the following diagram illustrates. In the diagram at the top of this slide, you can see several T curves along with the Z curve. Now the following are key characteristics of the T distribution. First of all, like the Z curve, all T curves are symmetrical with mean equal to zero. Also, all T curves have a greater standard deviation than the Z curve, and we can see that in the diagram as the T curves are lower and flatter than the Z curve, which is at the top. Each different T curve corresponds to a different value for what we call degrees of freedom, and the shorthand we use for that is DF, which increases as N increases. The greater the value of df, the closer the t-curve approximates the z-curve. In other words, as n approaches infinity, the degrees of freedom approaches infinity, and therefore t approaches z. Now note, the meaning of degrees of freedom in a statistical sense is the number of independent or free values that make up the calculation of a statistical parameter. In the case of a population mean, the degrees of freedom equals n minus 1 because for any particular value of mu, the values of n minus 1 of the n individual values can be varied with mu remaining the same as long as the last individual value is changed accordingly to suit the value for mu. In this course, values for df will be given for each different situation as the actual derivation of df in some instances can be quite mathematically complex, with such detailed mathematical work best left for further study. Using the t-distribution then, the formula for a ci mu becomes ci mu equals x bar plus or minus t alpha over 2 and degrees freedom equals n minus 1 times s divided by the square root of n, where s divided by the square root of n is equal to what's called the standard error of the mean, and we use the notation se subscript x bar. The t value used in the above formula is, as you can see, based upon two input parameters. First of all, alpha over 2 is the area of each of the lower and upper tails that lie outside of the confidence interval, as we've discussed previously. And secondly, the degrees freedom, df, equals n minus 1 for inferences about the mean mu for a single population. In other words, the t value to use for a confidence interval is a function of both the level of confidence, which, which determines what alpha is, and the sample size n, which determines the degrees of freedom. Similar to how we find z values, 
To determine the t-value that corresponds to the specific values of LOC and N, and therefore alpha and df, we use a special t-table that we see here on the right side of the slide. The procedure for obtaining a t-value is as follows. First, look across the top row to find the correct value for alpha over 2. Then look down the leftmost column to find the value for df. The number at the intersection of that column, of that row and column, is equal to t subscript alpha over 2 and df. Now, note that the diagram at the top of the table shows T alpha. For the symmetrical CIs that we are using here, however, there are two tails, one on either side of each CI. So the table values are actually for T subscript alpha over 2. The values for DF start at the top with DF equals 1 and increase by 1 until DF equals 100. The last value at the bottom of the second column is for df equal to infinity, which gives you, in fact, which actually gives you uh, t equal to the z value corresponding to the same level of confidence. As a general rule of thumb, for any degrees, for any df greater than 100, it's considered acceptable here to use df equal to infinity, which means to use the z curve instead of the t curve. The use of the t table is illustrated in the next example. In example three, we return to the sample of 10 harvested logs from a forest from example one. And we see the data here. These are ages in years. And we're asked to calculate 90%, 95%, and 99% confidence intervals for mu equals the mean age of harvested trees from this forest. So to answer this question, the general formula that we're going to use here is that the CI mu is equal to x bar plus or minus the t for alpha over 2 and degrees of freedom equals n minus 1 times s divided by the square root of n. So to calculate this confidence interval, we need to know the following. We need to know x bar and s, which we can calculate from the sample data. We need to know n, the sample size, which we know equals 10. And to get t, we need to know as well, uh, to get t, we need to know the, these two things. We need to know the degrees of freedom, which here is n minus 1, which equals 10 minus 1, which equals 9. And then we need to know alpha over 2. Now, <clears throat> alpha is equal to 1 minus the level of confidence. So alpha over 2 will be 1 minus the level of confidence over 2. So for a uh, 90 percent confidence interval, it would be 1 minus 0.9 divided by 2, which works out to be 0 0.05. And for a, 20, uh, for a 95 percent confidence interval, that would be 1 minus 0.95 over 2, which works out to be 0 0.025. And for a 99 percent confidence interval, it would be 1 minus 0.99 over 2, which is 0 0.005. And you'll get to know these um, numbers uh, the more as you, as you practice uh, problems like these, you'll become quite familiar with these uh, particular values that you'll be looking up in the, in the um, T table. So <clears throat> from the data, we figure out X bar as we've calculated X bar in the past. It's just uh, we add up all of the X values and divide by N. So we end up with 43.7 years. S is calculated uh, using the formula for sample standard deviation, and we get an answer rounded to four significant digits of 6.183 years. Now, note here, <clears throat> an important note is that <clears throat> we, we omit here the details for the calculations of X bar and S. And the reason we do this is that we've covered this, um, this, we've covered this type of calculation in previous lessons. And actually, for the remainder of this course,
so that we can focus on the essentials of inferential statistical methods. Examples and questions such as this one will use summarized data, which means that the statistics will just be provided rather than the raw data. So we won't, we won't be focusing at this point onwards much on uh, doing the actual calculations of these sample statistics, but rather working with the sample statistics that will already be uh, calculated for us. That's typical of what we're going to see for the rest of the course. So the next thing we do is we find the t-value from the table. Now, <clears throat> for each of the three levels of confidence, the degrees of freedom equals 9. So that stays the same for all three levels of confidence, so for all three confidence intervals. However, as the level of confidence changes, so does alpha, which means so does alpha over 2. So we get a different t-value as a result for each level of confidence as follows. So on this slide, we see that we have the calculations for the confidence intervals for 90%, uh, 95%, and 99% levels of confidence. And each of them include a, an excerpt from the t-table showing how the t-value is obtained. So we start with the 90% uh, level of confidence. And we see that from there, we can calculate that alpha over 2 equals 1 minus 0.9 over 2, which is 0 0.05. So to get the t value that we use in our calculation, we go to the table. We go across the top row, and we look for uh, 0 0.05. And that's the column that we use. And we see that circled in red. And then we go down the left column, and we look for degrees freedom equal to 9. And that's circled in red. And so we find the intersection of that row and the other column, and we see that circled in blue, we get our t-value of 1.833, and that's rounded to three decimal places. So we substitute that into our equation for the confidence interval for mu, and you'll see that we get that the ci mu equals x bar plus or minus the t that we've just obtained, uh, that we've just, uh, <clears throat> just the t that we've just um, found in the table times s divided by root n so that equals 43.7 plus or minus 1.833 times 6.183 divided by root 10 now that that the the that gives us 43.7 which is our x bar plus or minus 3.6 which is our margin of error now the base data is in the, so the raw data values are to the nearest whole number of years. So a general rule of thumb will follow is, is to calculate confidence intervals to one extra decimal place from our base data. And so that means we would calculate our confidence intervals to the one decimal place. Now, if the 43.7, um, if the sample mean uh, x bar, which here is 43.7, was a rounded number, we should carry one extra digit for both that number and the margin of error. But uh, since the, in this particular case, the 43.7 is works out exactly to be 43.7 when we calculate it. So that means we don't need to round to an extra digit. So we go 43.7 plus or minus and then we round the margin of error to also one decimal place. And then that will, that will allow us to get a, an answer rounded correctly to one decimal place. So that gives us a minimum value of 40.1 and a maximum value of 47.3. So our 90% confident, our confidence interval is between 40.1 and 47.3. And then similarly for the 95% confidence interval, we start by calculating alpha to be 1 minus 0.95 divided by 2, which is 0 0.025. So you can see in the table to the right that for this one, uh, we're in the same row of degrees freedom equals 9. So we're still in the DF equals 9 row, but now we shift over uh, to, the, uh, to the right to the 0 0.025 column. And so that gives us a T value to three decimal places of 2.262. So that's the only thing that changes in the uh, confidence interval mu formula. And so we end up with the same 43.7, but now our margin of error, it's plus or minus 4.4. So that gives us, and that's a larger margin of error, and remember, a bigger, a bigger confidence interval 
uh, gives us a, a wider margin of error. So now we get uh, a lower, lower limit and a higher upper limit. So our confidence in our 95% confidence interval goes from 39.3 to 48.1. And for the 99% confidence interval, alpha over 2 is 1 minus 0.99 over 2, which equals 0 0.005. So same row, df equals 9, but now we shift over to the column for 0 0.005, and now our t value equals uh, to three decimal places 3.250, and when we sub that in, we get a margin of error of 6.4. So now we get a confidence interval, 99% uh, confidence interval from 37.3 to 50.1. Let's review the results from the preceding example. The 90% confidence interval, it goes from 40.1 to 47.3, and the 95% confidence interval goes is wider and goes from 39.3 to 48.1, and the 99% confidence interval is even wider and goes from 37.3 to 50.1. And you can see the diagrams showing the confidence interval shaded in blue and how they become wider uh, as the level of confidence gets bigger. And one thing that all three confidence, confidence intervals have in common is that they're all centered on the same value of x bar, which equals 43.7. So a relevant question to ask at this point is, which of these confidence intervals is the best one to use as an estimate for mu? Well, we can begin to answer this by defining what each of these confidence intervals represents based on our sample results and assuming that all of our assumptions about the population are correct and that our sampling methods are random or unbiased. So the 90% confidence interval for mu is equal to 40.1 to 47.3. What that means is, is that we're 90% certain that the true value of mu in the population is somewhere between 40.1 and 47.3 years. And similarly, the 95% confidence interval for mu, which goes from 39.3 to 48.1, means that we are 95% certain that mu is between 39.3 and 48.1 years. And finally, the 99% confidence interval for mu which goes from 37.3 to 50.1 50 means that we are 99% certain that mu is somewhere between 37.3 and 50.1 years. As the diagrams of the confidence intervals for mu on the left show, as the level of confidence increases, the width of the confidence interval, which is equal to twice the margin of error, increases meaning that the estimate becomes less precise. There is therefore a trade-off between how precise our confidence interval estimate is and how confident we are that our confidence interval actually contains mu. So as to the question about which level of confidence is the best to use, the answer is that it depends upon how we wish to balance our level of precision, where the narrower the confidence interval, the better, with our level of confidence, where the wider the confidence interval, the better. Note that in the extreme case of a point estimate, we have the most precise possible estimate for mu, i.e. the single value x bar. However, as discussed previously, the associated level of confidence for a point estimate is zero. So a point estimate can really only be a preferred option if one is prepared to forego virtually any chance that their estimate might contain the target population parameter. In common practice, confidence intervals of either 90%, 95%, or 99% are typically used, although other values with lower or higher values of LOC may also be encountered. The preceding discussion about the trade-off between precision and level of confidence for confidence interval was based upon the assumption that the sample size n was fixed, as would normally be the case once the sample had already been collected. Let's, however, look at the formula for the margin of error, ME. 
which determines the width and therefore the precision of the confidence interval for any given level of confidence. That formula is ME equals T times S divided by the square root of N. So rearranging to solve for N, we get N equals T times S divided by the margin of error, all squared. Now this equation might seem to have N isolated on the left side. But since the t value on the right side has degrees freedom equal to n minus 1, in this case for a confidence interval for a population mean mu, n is actually implicitly embedded into the right side of the equation as well. Now this would make solving for n in terms of the margin of error and s a complex iterative process that's best left for further mathematical study. Now, for our purposes, however, we can get around this problem by recalling that as n approaches infinity, t approaches z. Therefore, for a sufficiently large sample size n, the formula above for n becomes n equals z times s divided by the margin of error, all squared, or more specifically, n minimum is equal to, and you see there's the arrow above the equal sign, which means that we round up. So we say that n minimum is the round up of z times s divided by the margin of error, all squared. The first formula above gives us the sample size required to meet the prescribed levels of precision and level of confidence. The formula to the right, the one with the arrow above the equal sign, the round up formula, is essentially the same, but it reminds us that both precision via a smaller margin of error and level of confidence increase with increased sample size n. So the equation gives us a minimum value for n, above which the margin of error would decrease and the level of confidence would increase. The up arrow above the equal sign reminds us that since n must be a whole number, it should always be rounded upwards. Note that the formula for n minimum includes the sample standard deviation, s. A problem with this is that we would typically want to calculate a minimum sample size before we had any sample data available to give us a value for s. This means that we either need to have some idea of the population standard deviation sigma, which as discussed previously, we typically do not know, or else we could take an initial preliminary sample and use the value for S from that in the formula above. Now the initial sample would typically be smaller than the value for N that we were anticipating getting from the above formula for practical reasons. For the purpose of this course, we will assume that where necessary, we will have sufficient preliminary data to provide us with a value for S for using the formula above. While the formula above is based upon Z instead of T, we can actually look up Z in the T table. Now, for these confidence intervals, since they have two tails with alpha over two, uh, area in each tail, we're actually looking up Z alpha over two values. And we can look up for th these values for special values of Z in the table because as previously mentioned, the very last row of the T table represents the case where degrees freedom is equal to infinity, which is equivalent to T equals Z. The diagram below on the slide illustrates how we can get Z alpha over two from the T table. We see that the row of Z values at the very bottom is circled in red. And the diagram here shows the example in blue of how we would find Z alpha over two when alpha was 0 0.05. So that's when our level of confidence is 95%. So one minus 0.95 divided by two gives us 0 0.025. And you see that that circled, that value 0 0.025 is circled in the top row, so that's our column. So the intersection of that column and the, and the bottom row gives us the value of T, which in this case is a Z value of 1.960 to three decimal places. 
and it's left to the reader to verify that the value of Z.025 is approximately equal to 1.960, and that's equivalent to the value that you would obtain from the Z table by looking up phi of Z equals 1 minus 0 0.025. In other words, uh, phi of Z equals 0.975. Now, note that the T table gives us values rounded to three decimal places while the Z table only gives us values to two decimal places. You should recall that from um, our previous look, uh, work with the Z table. Therefore, we can actually get more precise values for Z from the T table wherever, wherever it's possible. So it is recommended that where possible, and that will include all the confidence intervals we'll look at in this course, the T table should be used wherever possible to get these Z values for confidence intervals. We now look at an example where the influence of sample size on confidence intervals is considered. In example four, we return to the forest from examples one and two. And in part A, we're asked to recalculate the 95% confidence interval for mu, assuming the same sample mean and standard deviation, but this time from a sample of size n equals 5. In part B, we're asked to redo part A, this time with a sample size of n equals 50. And in part C, we're asked to calculate the minimum sample size required to obtain a 95% confidence interval for mu that is precise to within plus or minus one year. So the answers to this, these questions are as follows. For part A, we're looking for a 95% confidence interval. We have LOC equals 0.95 and N equals 5. And so using the formula that we have for confidence interval from U, it's going to equal 43.7 plus or minus the T value for 0 0.025. And that's our alpha over 2 is 0 0.025 and our degrees freedom equals 4 times 6.183 divided by the square root of 5. Now, we need to get that t value. So you see in the, uh, the excerpt from the table on the right, we're looking in the row of degrees freedom 4 and in the column of alpha over 2 equals 0 0.025, and we have a t value of 2.776. So substituting that into the formula, we end up with um, a margin of error of 7.7, .7, so our confidence interval is 43.7 plus or minus 7.7, .7, which equals 36.0 to uh, from 36.0 to 51.4. In part B, our level of confidence is 95% again, or 0.95, but this time we increase the sample size to 50 from 5 to 50. So what will change this time is that our degrees of freedom will now be 50 minus 1, or 49. And so we are now looking, you see the excerpt to the right from the t-table. Now we're uh, same column of 0 0.025, but now we go down to degrees of freedom 49, and now we get a t-value of 2.010. So we substitute that into the formula, and we end up with a margin of error that's reduced from 7.7 .7 to 1.8. And so we get 43.7 plus or minus 1.8. So our confidence interval goes from 41.9 to 45.5. Now in part C, where we are using the same com a level of confidence of 0.95, and we are told that we want our precision to be within plus or minus one year. So that means our margin of error equals one year. So using the assumption that n is large, as we discussed previously, we use the formula for n minimum. And so we the, the formula equals the round up of the z for alpha over 2 times s divided by the margin of error. So that's going to be, now for the z for 0 0.025, is equal to, and that's, as we've seen before, that's the value from the bottom row for 0 0.025, and we get 1.960. So the calculation is 1.960 times 6.183 divided by 1, all squared. And now that number equals 146.86, which rounds up to 147. So therefore, Based on this previous sample data, we can say that 
the minimum future sample size required to obtain an interval estimate from you that is within plus or minus one year with a 95% level of confidence is 147 harvested trees. The results from the preceding example can be summed up in the diagram below on the slide. The three graphs all share in common that the shaded area, which is the level of confidence, is equal to 95% or 0.95. Moving down from graph to graph, however, the sample size n increases, and we can see that as this happens, the confidence intervals become narrower. In other words, the confidence intervals become more precise, which is what we want to happen. The bottom graph illustrates <clears throat> the cost of holding the level of confidence steady at 0.95 while decreasing the margin of error to plus or minus one year. We must nearly triple the sample size, in this case from 50 to 147. The bottom line is that in order to derive interval estimates with both sufficient confidence and precision, we must invest in the cost of obtaining sufficiently large samples. Confidence interval estimates for population proportions, which we'll call CIP, are calculated based on a similar procedure as that which we follow for population means CIMU. For CIP, we can use Z, the standard normal distribution, which means we can use we, we only need to use the last row of the t-table and we don't need to be concerned with degrees of freedom. Now the mathematical reasons for this, for the reason why this is the case for CIPs and not generally for CIMUs is left for further mathematical study beyond this course. Since we're using the normal distribution to model the distribution of P, we'll, we'll assume that the sample size N is sufficiently large uh, for that. The formula for CIP is derived in the same general way that we derived CIMU earlier, although we will omit the, the mathematical details uh, of this derivation as they're beyond the scope of this course. What you do see here on this slide is that we use Z, and Z is defined in this particular case as being the difference between the sample proportion P bar and P, the population proportion P, so that we have P bar minus P, divided by the square root of p times 1 minus p over n. So what that means then is that the probability that z or p bar minus p over the square root of p times 1 minus p over n being that is between z minus z alpha over 2 and positive z alpha over 2 is equal to the level of confidence that we seek to have. So what that leads to is the conclusion that the formula or the, what that leads to is the final formula for the confidence interval for P, which equals P bar plus or minus Z alpha over two times the square root of P bar times one minus P bar over N, which gives us a confidence interval that goes from a lower limit of P bar minus Z alpha over two times square root P bar times one minus P bar over N and a, an upper limit of p bar plus plus z alpha over 2 times square root of p bar times 1 minus p bar over n. Now, uh, in this particular case, a p bar, which is the sample proportion, as we've discussed previously, is defined as uh, equaling x over n, where x is the number of successes in the sample. That and, and again, we use that sort of uh, loose definition of success, whether it's a good or a bad thing. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, where that, now the square root of p bar times 1 minus p bar over n, that's equal to what's called the standard error of the proportion, or SE subscript p bar. Now note that in the formula above for CIP, that's at the end of this derivation, the p times 1 minus p that you initially saw in the first line has been replaced with p bar times 1 minus p bar. The reason for this is that we do not know the value of p, which of course is the reason why we're trying to estimate it in the first place. So we use the sample proportion p bar that we can get from the sample results or the sample data. And we use that p bar as an estimate for this per parameter value. This is similar to how we use s as an estimate of sigma 
when generating CI mus. In example five, a referendum is planned in a community with residents asked whether or not they want to see the main downtown street converted into a car-free pedestrian area. In advance of the vote, a random survey of 135 residents in the community is conducted, of which 80 residents indicate they are in favor of the pedestrian area plan. Based upon the sample data, and assuming that the population of eligible voters is significantly larger than the sample size, we're asked to do the following. In Part A, we're asked to calculate 90%, 95%, and 99% confidence intervals for the proportion of eligible voters in this community who support the plan. And in Part B, we're asked to comment on whether there appears to be sufficient evidence that the majority of residents in this community are in favor of the plan. And specifically, we're also asked to answer, uh, we're also asked if the answer to this question is the same at the LOC values of 95% and 99%. So to answer these questions, in Part A, we first calculate the sample proportion. So P bar is equal to X over N, where X is the number of people in this particular case who, who are of the, of the people surveyed who indicate they're in favor of the plan, which is 80 divided by the sample size, which is 135. So P bar equals 80 over 135, which to four significant digits equals 0 0.5926. Now that we have that, we can calculate the CIP for each of the levels of confidence. So for the calculations of the three confidence intervals, what will be the same is the uh, P bar value, which is 0.5926, and the standard error of P bar, which is the square root of 0 0.5926 times 0 0.4074 over 135. What will be different, the only thing that will be different is the Z value that we use. So for 90% it's Z.05 and for 95% it's Z.025 and for 99% it's Z.005. And so those values respectively are 1.645, 1.960 and 2.576. And we can see that with everything else being the same, the way the formula is structured, we're going to get a, a wider uh, as as the level of confidence goes up, our margin of error will get bigger, so our confidence intervals will get wider. So we use uh, four sig figs here for the point estimates and the margins of error. But then as these um, proportions are actually percentages, we'll round to the nearest percent, which is two decimal places. So what we end up with is uh, for the 90% confidence interval, 4P, we get 0.5926 plus or minus 0 0.0696, which rounds to from 0 0.52 to 0 0.66. For 95%, we get CIP is, is <clears throat> equal to 0.5926 plus or minus 0 0.0829, which rounds to 0 0.51 to 0 0.68. And for 99%, we get CIP is equal to 0.5926 plus or minus 0 0.1089, which rounds to 0 0.48 to 0 0.70. For part B, we start by noting that if a majority of residents are in favor of the plan, that means, that must mean that P, the, the true P value must be greater than 0 0.5, greater than one half. So we, to, to answer the question, we're asked to analyze the level, the 95 and 99% levels of confidence, confidence intervals. And we can see, if we look at the confidence interval at 95%, that goes from, from 0.51 to 0.68. Now this only includes values of, of P that are greater than 0 0.5. However, when we go to the 99% uh, confidence interval, we see that that goes from 0.48 to 0 0.70. Now those two numbers, uh, that confidence interval straddles um, 0 0.5. In other words, 0 0.5 is somewhere in between 0.48 and 0 0.70. So what that means is there's, there's, a, there's that part of the confidence interval, the, some lower portion of the confidence interval where P is actually less than um, or equal to 
0.5. So therefore, we can conclude that at the level of confidence uh, 95%, there is sufficient evidence to suggest that a majority of residents are in favor of the plan. But at level of confidence equal to 99%, the evidence to this effect is insufficient. To determine the minimum sample size required to generate a CIP, we proceed in a similar way as we did with the CI mu. We start with the idea that the margin of error uh, is equal to, and in this case for proportions, the margin of error is equal to Z alpha over two times square root of P bar times one minus P bar over N. And from there, we can rearrange and solve. And finally, we get that n is equal to p bar times 1 minus p bar times the square of z alpha over 2 over me. Now, similar to the situation in determining n minimum for ci mu's, the formula above for n is problematic because we don't know what p bar is until after we have conducted the sample. Now we can solve this problem as with the case of CI mu by taking a small preliminary sample and using p bar from it. However, since we are trying to determine a sample size that is as large as necessary for a prescribed level of confidence and precision, it's more prudent to use a value for p bar that would simply maximize whatever n min is. And we can do this by considering that in the equation above, n varies directly with p bar times 1 minus p bar. In other words, we fix the value of z because we fix the value of alpha. That's alpha over 2 because that's based on a level of confidence. And we generally fix our desired margin of error. So the only part of that equation for n that varies is the p bar times 1 minus p bar. And we note that mathematically, the, math, the maximum value for p bar times 1 minus p bar is actually equal to 0.25, which is the case when both p bar and 1 minus p bar are equal to 0.5. Now it's left to the reader using some calculus to verify that that must be true. But we will go with the conclusion uh, for that, that the, the largest that p bar times 1 minus p bar can, can ever be is 0.25. Um, so as a general rule, therefore, we will assume for the sake of determining minimum sample size, that p bar is equal to 0.5, and that will give us the, the largest possible value of n, n min, which is actually a conservative approach that will give us uh, the best chance of having a sufficiently large sample size. So we'll do that when we're determining n min for a CIP. So therefore, the formula for n min is n min is equal to the round up of 0.25 times the square of z alpha over 2 over me. In example 6, we refer back to the previous example about the community pedestrian area referendum. Assuming that the population is significantly larger than any sample size that might be used, calculate the minimum sample size required to produce a 99% CIP precise to within the following margins of error. A is plus or minus 10%, B is plus or minus 3%, and C is plus or minus 1%. So to answer this question, we use the formula that we just developed in the previous slide. And so what we'll have in all, in all three cases for all three margins of error is we'll be using the same um, Z value for a 99% confidence interval, which would be Z for alpha over 2 equals 0 0.005. So that would equal 2.576. And we can get that from the bottom of the T table. And so we use the formula where we would go 0 0.25 times the square of that Z value, 2.576, divided by our margin of error. So it'll be the margin of error that we change in for the three different values in parts A, B, and C. Now remember that these are percentage points and percentage values. So we need to convert those from percents to their decimal equivalents. So 10% is 0.1 
and 3% is 0 0.03, and 1% is 0 0.01. So substituting those numbers in, we get the answers. And remember that we round up so that we have an, uh, our minimum value of n will at least meet the criteria, as we've discussed before. So the answers that we would get in parts a, b, and c, respectively, are 166, 1,844, and 16,590. Notice in the answers above how this illustrates that there's a significant cost to pay in order to improve the precision of a confidence interval estimate while maintaining the same level of confidence. In other words, to, to, between 10% to go from uh, plus or minus 10% to the much more precise plus or minus 1%, which is quite narrowly precise, we would have to increase from 166 to 16,590 people in our sample. I hope that you found this video helpful. If you liked it and would like to see more from Ursa Campus, then please subscribe. And also, if you'd like to send your feedback, that's always welcome too. Thanks for watching, and I wish you well with your studies.